So hi everybody, sorry for the delay. So after having a nice session about how we should all be kind together as a distribution and work together, I will now explain why Debian is better than the other. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that was a kind of an unfortunate process. But no, that's not the point. The point is rather uh, going in the direction of one of the points which was made before. So I think that every distribution should actually make very clear what are the, the, the reason for its existence, the goal it has to play. And this talk is about this, the specific things about Debian, which I think uh, deserve it to be a uh, using distribution and in, in face of some of the fads that sometimes we see about that. So uh, I here start talking about Debian with this slide, which is a quote from Ian Murdoch, who founded Debian in 1993. And back then he said something like, follow Linux, sir. That was a post on the Usenet news, uh, on the news group. Uh, this is just to announce the imminent completion of a brand new Linux release, which I'm calling Debian Linux release. So in, 19, in 1993, Ian thought that Debian was about to be completed. We are here 18 years later, and it's not completed, and it will probably never be. So still, in that many, there are some of the reasons which go to the creation of Debian. So one of the goals was to make a non-commercial distribution still able to compete with commercial operating systems was to make a distribution easy to install, so the notion of being easy to install back then was not exactly the same as we have today. Uh, also, he made the point of having the distribution built collaboratively by software experts, meaning people that know the software they're packaging rather than they only know the actual packaging techniques. And it was historically the first major distribution developed in its own world openly in the spirit of GNU, and in the beginning was also founded by the GNU project. So now we are 17 years later than that. We have a distribution with 30,000 binary packages into that. We have already 12 times. The last release happened this night. Uh, we are like 1,000 developers doing Debian, about 900 DDs and 120 DMs, plus translators and uh, porters, and then a couple of other thousand of contributors all over the world. We have probably the largest number of ports across mainstream distribution. We have nine in Squeeze. We have, for the first time, two non Linux ports, which are K for BSD 32 and 64 bits. We have uh, in an unofficial set of ports, including the GNU Hard Port, which is probably the GNU Herd Port, which is probably the most advanced Herd Port existing. And we have spawned something like 120 derivative distributions, according to this to watch. So, overall, I think that's a success. <laughs> So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive to see that stuff they call mainstream. Yes. How do you define mainstream? Uh, so that's, that's a very good question. So it's kind of difficult, and I use the popularity of distribution which I see out there, and there are sites ranking distribution according to popularity. But I agree, it's not a clear-cut definition, it's just what I can find out there using how much people talk about it on the web and this kind of stuff. I have no other better definition to propose. I'm thinking about it. Comparing that with Gen2, I'm not sure if it, which one is, it, is, is the, are those numbers from, uh, larger than ours? Uh, I have no idea. I really have no idea. So I take best so the, the, my best guess is using the website for ranks distribution and have a look at the top list or something like that. Yeah, but I'm thinking that if you uh, in, if can do as a mainstream distro, are you still a large number of course? Yes, okay, so, I, I, I mean, I don't know, I use the ranking sites and I see what, yes, so, how many ports have Gen 2? <coughs> oh, um, yeah, but, uh, but how do you define that? Right. Okay, so can I say, can I say one of the largest number of ports? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, still things changed significantly from 1993 to today. Today we have a lot of other distributions of both of GNU Linux or of other kernel, free kernel out there, and Debian is principally just one of them. There are tons of them. So, uh, and some of the other distro releases more often than Debian. Some of them have very tight release schedules every six months. Some of the distro have more users than Debian. Some of the other distro innovate more, if that means something. Some of them get more credit, more press report about the existence, existence of Debian. And there are a whole lot of other fads about Debian. So one might reasonably ask, so could the bloody hell cares about Debian? Which, by the way, is an Australian expression used for the LCA talk. In general, one may wonder if Debian is still relevant. And more generally, as we see before, what is the role of Debian in the current ecosystem of free software? So I have two main arguments which make me believe that Debian is still relevant. It actually is more relevant than ever. The first reason is that I think Debian does some things better than others. 
And there is a mixture of features which are pretty unique in Debian, and which I think we should, be, we should have clear in mind. So the first one is a focus on quality. So I think that in Debian we have a very strong focus on package quality, and that's come from various aspects. So first of all, we have a stringent policy of how packages should look like, which is called the Debian policy. We have extensive testing of packages to check whether they match this policy or not automatically. We have stress testing of packages to check if they are installable in all possible configurations and in all possible upgrade runs. And we have extensive tests for rebuilding the archive. And that's very important because Free software is useful, and one of the freedom which gives you is the ability to change your software, but if you, if you cannot rebuild your software once you change it, then something is wrong. Then free software is just a potential that you are not really able to fully exploit. And then, another point which I've already made is that package maintainers in Debian are usually software experts, so that means that when you report a bug about, for instance, a scientific application, you usually, you usually end up uh, talking with someone which is an expert of that scientific field. So that really helps in terms of user support, and all the packages in archive are equal. So we don't have first class or second class packages. In principle, all of them are required to be uh, to live up to the same standard of quality. And when we say that Debian is when it's ready, so the point is really that we are not willing to trade our quality requirements for some deadline we have set up here. So that's the first feature that I think is quite important on Debian. Package quality, I focus on that. The second, second point is uh, um, software freedom. That might sound obvious to, uh, to free software supporter, but in fact it is not. So David has been promoting free software values in 1993, and it's free the bottom up. And with that I mean two things. The first one is that all the software you get in Debian is free software, including firmware. Okay? But that's completely free software. And the second thing is that in the infrastructure we use to make Debian is completely free. No one in Debian will, will accept a developer-oriented service which is not free software, and Debian user will not for sure accept to have to use non-free services to, for instance, report back or this kind of stuff. I really, I really think it's, it's important to see that to show that we are able to do our distribution using only free software. And community, Debian community knows, and uh, trust Debian to be faithful to these principles. And all this, I think, sets a high bar for, for software supporters around the world to kind of compare with Debian in terms of how much are we free and how much are we not. Third point is independent. So Debian is uh, an independent distribution, meaning that there is no single company with which is associated to Debian. And that is quite important. We, how do we live then if, you don't, if we don't have a single, a single company babysitting us? Well, we receive donations, money from people. There are companies, different companies, that from time to time donate us hardware or money to run our conference, for instance. And everything else is gift economy. So it's an exchange of work among developers. And this is quite remarkable among uh, popular distribution or mainstream distribution because if you think of many other distributions, usually you can associate them to single companies. And this is, I believe it's very important because one can trust Debian choice not to be driven by profit. We have some principle, we have people trying to uphold those principles and everything else it doesn't really matter. The last point, which I consider a rather unique feature of Debian is how we take decisions. And we take a decision by a mixture of do, what I call a duocracy and a democracy. So democracy is just the, the, the usual way we do things in free software. So and if someone working on something is free to take the decision he wants on that specific topic, and that is something which is guaranteed by the Debian Constitution. But then in Debian we have also a democratic process in which we can take decisions all together and cover up when democracy fails, but usually we use that only for uh, principal decision, not really for technical decision. So this is pretty rare to find. And uh, in the consequence of that is that reputation in the project follows works. So you are no, well known in the Debian project if you've done a lot of work, generally. And it means also that there is really no benevolent dictator, even Debian project leader is just someone who actually coordinates activities. So it's not something who takes decision in place of others. And more generally, it means that there are no imposed decision on how the project will evolve, by who has the money, by who owns the infrastructure, by who employs people, on all this kind of stuff. So altogether, this is this made my first argument why I think Debian should live long and prosper. Because in general, I think we really need in the distribution market players which are popular, which are independent from uh, the need of money, and which can be trusted to uphold some specific principles that come from, come, that come with the software. So. What I'm worried about not having such players in the arena is that one day 
distribution which are run by companies might have interests that conflict with the need of free software. Uh, and moreover, having independent players guarantee that other distribution which are maybe associated to uh, companies will, which will have demands to their companies to become more and more independent, to be able more and more to uh, drive their own board. So that was my first argument. So having uh, an independent player with firm principles and agreement about that with the community. And my second argument is that Debian is at the root of a huge tree of derivative distributions. So very quickly, what is a derivative distribution? It is essentially applying some specific free software freedoms to a whole distribution. So you take an existing distribution, you patch and there will be packages, you add some new packages if you need, and then you ship that to your users and periodically you synchronize with the distribution you started from. This is kind of the risk side to have a driving distribution. And we have seen a lot of them and they, I really think they are game changers. Because with derivatives, the project which are creating a derivative distribution can focus on the customization and can reuse Every, um, all the rest of the work, being able to work more specifically on a specific set of target users, for instance. And everybody wins if we do this problem, really. Because the derivative can massively reuse other work, and that's clearly a benefit, and the mother distro, the distribution where derivatives come from, reach out to new users and probably to a public that you, you wouldn't be able to reach out to if it was not for the, for the derivative. So Debian specifically has been a base for a lot of derivatives. So according to DistroWatch, we have like 120 derivatives, as I said before, and there are a lot of them. And the reason why I think those distributions decided to base their work on Debian are these four reasons. So guarantees of quality on packages and on check in uh, licensing work that we have been doing in Debian is a very solid base system. And we have a huge collection of packages with 30,000 binary packages. And we tend to be, we have this motto of being the universal operating system, meaning that we are not specifically customized for specific target usages. So it's pretty, it should be really easy to customize that for a specific set of target users. Uh, there is this minor distribution you might have heard of. <laughs> and that's a very, uh, probably the most known example of Debian derivative. So it was started in 2004 by Canonical. It's a Debian derivative. It's very popular. So if you look at popcorn data, for instance, uh, you see that it probably has a user base, which is 20 times the user base of Debian. And uh, it's an archive. It's kind of historically was split in two parts, a main and a universe, where the corporate part was more working on the main, while the community was working on the universe. And it's heavily customized in main, so that we have also independent packages of several uh, upstream software, and it's very close to Debian elsewhere. So uh, in this picture, what you see is the amount of packages which are shipped by Ubuntu to their users, according to whether they are unmodified Debian packages. There are like 34% of that in, uh, in uh, what's the data for links. There are 18% of packages which are modified Debian packages, and there are um, about 7% of packages which are upstream software not packaged in Debian. And um, so, uh, OK. And the Debian Ubuntu is not the only one, of course. There is a huge tree of derivatives. There are many other distributions based directly on Debian. And also, it's starting to get worse between quotes. So the Ubuntu is starting to have derivatives, and derivatives of derivatives, and so on and so forth. So uh, what is happening is that Debian ended up being at the root of a huge tree of the derivative distribution, which heavily depend on Debian and on its well-being. And this is so even if your distribution does not tell you that. Okay? So all those distributions are doing very, very good at customizing software, but for everything else, they rely on the work which is done on that. Um, so just some concluding thoughts about that. So what I think is happening recent, in recent years in the market of distribution is that the software distribution pipeline has changed. So this is how it looked like like five to 10 years ago. So we used to have a string software here. We used to have some vendors, some distribution here, which basically package the software for the final users. Okay? And then we have some flows among the various actors. So we used to have software, software which flows from left to right, but records and batches from right to left. But now this has, been, this has changed quite a lot in recent years. And now we have a very long, a very long pipeline of software distribution. So we have upstream here. We might have another distribution in between, like Debian. We might have another distribution here, which is Ubuntu, and so on and so forth. 
Okay? And again, we, we should have the same flow of uh, software and patches that we used to have before. So software should flow from left to right, and by patches, by, uh, reports and patches should flow from right to left. And all this is wonderful, because freedom spreads. So every single uh, link we add in the chain, potentially we reach out to new users. And that's good for everything, for everyone, sorry. And we get more eyeballs, which can fix more bugs, and we also get more potential contributors. But we should be very aware of the fact that all this should be, first of all, sustainable. Because if adding links means that links before in the chain suffer, then we have a problem. And moreover, we should, be, uh, we should care about the fact that have all this actually benefits not individual distributions or individual software projects, but rather free software as a whole. So I have a sort of recipe, which I think we should all keep in mind to make that happen. And the recipe is based on the observation that free software is keeping in mind that the goal is free software, is not the benefit of an individual project. Free software is bigger than any single project, than any single distribution, than Debian and Ubuntu and than every other software vendor out there. And if we care about free software, then we should take care that at each link in this chain, we give back changes. So if we, if we change something at any point in the chain, we should try to give those changes back on the left. And we should also take care of the fact that users should know where the, the work they are using comes from. So making clear who is working on what, because it's useful for users to know and to direct their contribution that, that way. So coming back to the question at the beginning of the talk, so who the bloody hell cares about Debian? I think you should. And I think it's so for two reasons. So first of all, because Debian still offers a cocktail of features which are which taken all together are pretty rare. And uh, also because Debian it started the root of a huge set of distributions which actually benefit from its work, the work being done there. And finally, let's all remember that ultimately free software is better served by collaboration of all these distros than by doing things in isolation. So I, I try to keep some time for questions, so thank you for listening. I kind of imagined that. <laughs> we checked the internet, it was 13, uh, but some of those are probably not that active in anything. <laughs> okay. And on the other end, I know that the 11 ports we have now, they are maintained because we released them yesterday. Yeah, but, <laughs> but you automatically build those because anyone who tests it all. Um, motor? It depends, uh, of course. There are some that are less active. But um, there are some automated tests that are running on the, the machines. We also depend pretty much, uh, at least the, the, the packages are still dependent on other packages, those are different because they get of the build system there. But yeah, there are, it, it's probably true that some architectures are on the tests and others because they have to see them. But at the very least, they, 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 they work and they do because that, and, and just some, some other parts are. are if they're released, they, they you can use it. Other questions? So the, the, was not really a question. Was making a point that Gen two has like thirteen ports, while Debian has eleven. That was the correcting my number at the beginning. Yeah, because I wrote that the collaboration between mainstream distro and derivative is not so good. Most of the time, on um, do you think it's real? And um, uh, can you explain how we can mm -hmm. collaborate to that and try to fix such an issue? Because we should think about the problem should return to the main line or so the, the question is, um, he believes that the collaboration between derivatives is not that good, and how can we improve where we as users or contributors, yeah. or even users? Okay, actually, I, I I wouldn't say that it's not that good. It used to be worse than, than what it is now, and I think we are getting better and better. So for instance, we have set up a contact point, which is the derivatives form desk, which is actually my first spam slide. And um, it's a contact point where we invite all distribution based on Debian, either directly or transitively, to actually uh, join together and use that point to discuss how to push their changes back to Debian. So the problem is the same we were discussing in the session before this one. If you want to push something back to Debian, maybe you don't know how to do that. Maybe you don't know 
who you should contact to do that, and this is an initiative to fix that. So it's, I think it's getting better and better, and uh, of course, it's, I think the point is that before the success stories that Ubuntu has to tell about their users, we, we, we were not very aware of the problem. Because all other distribution were used, changing very little of them, and I mean they just reported bug and they really didn't need to collaborate a lot with us. Well, with Ubuntu things has changed, and I think it's we should fix the problem there so, so that we set a very example case for every, any other distribution out there, not only they and Mesa. So how you can use as users? Well, uh, that's a good question because I never think about that. So first of all, I think you should communicate about the fact that. Uh, where the works come from, because it's useful to know in general. It's, it's useful to know that there is a collaboration of projects which are working together to actually deliver some specific software, and maybe push for pushing changes back when that is not happening by, by itself alone. You mentioned open rules as the main derivative. Uh, no, I don't think so. I think I mentioned it as a as a distro the list. Oh yes, can we fix that? Uh, open Zauros was took the ideas from Debian, but it was built from scratch. Okay. Without using Debian packages. I would fix that slide. We use a lot of patches in Debian, but it was not uh, Debian. Okay, thanks. Anything else? Let me try to get out of this embarrassment to present you the last spam slide, which is the new squeeze has arrived. It's been early this night. So there are still a lot of parties to be done. And uh, actually we also have a new website. It's incredible, but we do have a new website. WW team which has worked on that the past month and I, I think they have worked like 40 hour, 48 hours straight to deliver this together with the release of Squid. Thank you.